You got only one job, dude. Welcome, Allison. Episode number 33. 33. Wow, we're getting older. I know. So Who's what are we going to talk about today? So it is my favorite time of the year. Christmas. Thanksgiving? No. Why do you skip Thanksgiving? I, listen, I don't skip Thanksgiving, but you don't need an entire month for Thanksgiving. You should be thankful every day. Well, you know that in, in Venezuela, we don't celebrate Thanksgiving. No, I've been celebrating. <laughs> well, I guess you wouldn't. It's an American <laughs> holiday. <laughs> so for, you know, for us, when I moved, uh, when I moved to the country, you know, like all we see was, all we watch is what we were fed on television, but we didn't really, I never really had that uh, sense of uh, cultural things. So okay. So, do you celebrate Thanksgiving now that you oh, are? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, now we do. Yeah, we could do the whole thing. We do the family. We do the the turkey. So here's here's the question: mm -hmm. How do you cook your turkey? Oven. The oven. Yeah, yeah. I'm not, I've never deep fry. I probably one day will try to deep fry. But to be honest with you, I don't think that I've cooked a. Turkey so far this year. I've always been in families' houses and, mm -hmm. and 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 friends. I mean, always people celebrating. I don't I don't recall ever cooking an oven. Uh, cooking. Actually, Elise is the one that cooks the turkey on the oven. I. You know what? I don't cook on Thanksgiving, <laughs> I, and I love cooking. You know, don't get me wrong. I cook all the time, but I haven't. I have. I think, now that I'm thinking about it, you know, I have. I haven't cooked. Do you? Do I cook on Thanksgiving? So we're out of town this year for Thanksgiving. So mm -hmm. we're having Thanksgiving this Saturday mm -hmm. at my house. Yep. And um, we are air frying our turkey. This air fry. So good. We have a huge air fryer. So you're breaking all sort of traditions. All, in all there. traditions, except we still have my grandmother's dressing. So it's how not would stuffing, how, it's how would dressing. <laughs> how do you feed a turkey in an air fryer? Isn't the air fryers like? No, it looks like it looks like a pot that you would fry it in. Okay. Like it's it's round. Full disclosure: I don't own an air fryer. Well, you're missing out. That's what I heard. You know, my mother's always told me like, "You gotta get an air fryer. You gotta get an air fryer." <laughs> I mean, I got so many stuff in the kitchen that. But yeah, so we're we're celebrating Thanksgiving this Saturday, mm -hmm. but I may or may not have already decorated a bit for Christmas since I've... I'm going to be out of town. <laughs> um, but I'm excited about our guest because he owns a local Christmas tree farm. Okay. 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 <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were going to keep talking about no. him. No. You want to hear him? Yeah. All right, let's hear what he had to say, Glenn. And welcome, Glenn. Glenn Miller, how are you doing today, sir? I'm good. How are you guys? Thanks for having me. Thank you for coming on. We're excited to hear all about what you have going on in Chapin, especially with the holiday season coming up. Yeah, sounds good. All right, so tell us a little bit about, uh, we were talking off camera, you said you were born and raised here in Chapin. Yeah, I grew up off of Westinger Road. Um, uh, my parents been there since the late 70s. Um, I was born in 83, so been 40 years right here 1983 huh? that sounds uh that's not too far man not too far from us <laughs> <laughs> so you've seen the growth of Chapin since you were a kid like what do you think has been uh you know the biggest difference from where you grew up in Chapin and where it is now 40 years ago uh no question the difference is the availability to just get things I can remember being a small kid and having to ride all the way to Harbison with my parents for like just about anything. And now you can just go right down the street and get it. So it's grown a lot. Businesses coming to the area mm -hmm. has, has changed a lot of things. The traffic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There used to be no traffic. Uh, we got some traffic now. Yeah, we do. It's still not as bad as it sounds, to be honest with you. I've been in places where the traffic is just completely horrible. 
Uh, yeah. From one uh, to ten, being ten, uh, grid lock, I would say we're still at a four or five. So I, I have a very high bar. I know for. I was going to say, it all depends on what you're used to. I grew up in a small town in South Carolina, very similar to Chapin, and um, I've been here 10 years, but. To me, Glenn, the traffic is bad as well. But <laughs> I mean, it's, it's changed a lot since the nineties. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, absolutely. Yeah, back, back then, it was. Uh... Glenn, and talking about the business growth and the availability, you yourself have a business running right now in Chapin, right? That's a Lakewood Trees Farm. Yes. Uh, so we started a Christmas tree farm back in 2019. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, it takes a long time to get something like that up and going, but we'll open this year. Um, for our first time, uh, day after Thanksgiving, and um, we'll remain open until we sell out. But uh, we're gonna uh, see how it goes. All right. So you basically plant some Christmas trees in your land, let them grow, and then let people cut them off during this time of the year so they can bring it down to their houses. Correct? That's correct. We are a choose and cut Christmas tree farm. Um, we plant roughly 300 trees a year um and our goal is to have uh, around 2,000 trees on the property uh, to choose from once our footprint is completely filled out right now we have 1300 trees i'll plant two more times uh to get us up to that 1900 mark and if i can squeeze in another 100 we'll hit our 2000 um, we won't be doing any of the choose and cut this year I'm going to bring in Fraser firs from North Carolina, which is a very popular tree um, that people want. Uh, so we'll have those available this year. And then next year, I'll have those in addition to the ones we're growing, which are Leafland and Murray Cypress. Um, people will be able to come out and go out into the field and find the one they like and cut it down themselves. And we'll net it up for them and help them get it on the way to their house. So I would assume the average size tree would be six feet and up that someone would be looking for in their home. How long is the growth period to get the tree from, say, a sapling to where it's ready to cut to go to someone's home for Christmas? So the trees I grow are a little faster than Fraser firs. Um, we'll start with the ones that I grow. Um, when I put them in the ground, they're about 12 inches tall, um, and it takes about six years five to six years um, in in optimal conditions. Um, I will have some that uh, could take eight years. Um, it'll just depend on the soil that it was planted in and the sun that it gets and, and the, the root system it forms. Um, so it could take anywhere from six years to, to probably eight years uh, to, to get one of the ones that I grow ready for sale. Um, a Fraser fir grows one foot a year. So if you buy, a, uh, you're right, your most common tree is probably around seven feet. Um, you know, most houses have an eight foot ceiling. Some do have 10 and, and larger. But, you know, if you're getting an eight foot Fraser fir, it took at least eight years for that tree to form. Um, it may be even longer, but at best, you're getting about a foot a year. From, okay. From uh, Glenn, what's the price range that uh, people will be looking at this year? So a Fraser fir, um, depending on the grade you get, um, you know, a, a six to seven footer is probably going to run you somewhere between one hundred and twenty and one hundred fifty dollars. Uh, a seven to eight um, is probably going to run you, you know, the one hundred and seventy five mark, roughly. An eight to nine could be two uh, up to 240, but it's going to depend on the grade of the tree. Mm -hmm. I bought premium trees, which which are the, you know, the, the nicest tree uh, you can get. Um, I did buy some number one and number twos as well to, to provide a little more affordable option, um, but it'll all depend on the grade of the tree. Now, how, how are they graded? I, I've never really thought much about that. We've always just gone out and gone, oh, that's a pretty <laughs> tree. We'll take that one. <laughs> so from my understanding, and, um, and you know, I'm, I'm a paramedic. That's, that's what I know. I did that for 10 years. Um, I, I don't do it anymore, but th that's really what I'm trained in. So, you know, I'm speaking from what I've learned 
um, just talking with other farmers and, and of course the people I buy from. Um, but you're, you, you said, you know, you look for the pretty tree. Trees are graded more on, on their appeal than their height. Um, as the height gets taller, of course, the, the cost goes up. But um, so uh, a premium tree would be a perfect tree. Everybody's probably been out to a tree farm and saw a tree and they said, you know, I really like this one. We'll just have to put this part of it in the corner, you know, because it's got a big open spot or something like that. So um, a premium tree, you're not going to you're not going to have to do that. It's going to be perfect all the way around from top to bottom. OK, um, a, a number one is pretty much the same thing. Um, and then a number two, that's going to be that tree that you're going to say, you know, I really like this part of the tree. I think it'll look good in my house because I can hide that part in the corner. Uh -huh. um, but that, that's the easiest way I can explain it. And that's the way it was explained to me uh, when I uh, was doing my research on it. So what's like, what's the highest quality, best tree, the most premium one that you ch should have this year? You know, like it's. It's a number three. Do you, do you have those? No, no, it would it would be called a uh, number one or better uh -huh. is what they call it. Um, some people also call it a premium. Um, so it's it's in the category of a number one. Mm -hmm. So if you want a perfect tree, you want that number one or better, or what some people call a premium. A number two would be you know the one I described as maybe having a hole in the side or you know something that you just want to kind of put off to the side. Um, they do have number threes. I didn't, I didn't buy any of them. Um, so I won't have any of those available, but that would be, um, I've never heard it put this way, but we'll call it the Charlie Brown tree. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Charlie Brown trees need love too. Oh, they, they definitely do. They definitely do. So um, I'm curious, you said your background is in paramedics. How do you go from being a paramedic to a Christmas tree farm owner? Walk us through um, how that came about and, and what that looked like. Yeah, so um, I did I did 10 years as a paramedic. Um, injured my neck really bad uh, when I was 33, had mirror surgery. Uh, decided to move on from that. Um, took an educator role for a hospital system. Did that for a number of years um, and uh, left uh, when the pandemic occurred because our child's daycare was constantly shutting down and it just became impossible for me to miss work anymore. My wife's a nurse practitioner. So, um, with her having the better, better career, um, I took on taking care of my kids. And, um, just before that happened, my wife had, uh, approached me and said, Hey, you know, we have this property. I want to start a Christmas tree farm. And I said, okay, uh, well, <laughs> If, if you want to do that, um, and I put the ball in her court, I said, why don't you find a wholesale tree uh, tree distributor and, and get uh, 15 trees, and we'll plant them and just kind of take a look at things and see how it goes. So she did that, and um, so we planted those little 15 trees, and about a month later, we said, you know what, let's just do it. So we ordered 300 more, planted them. And we've done that every year since. Um, and I've had more time on my hands mm -hmm. having my job and being at home with my kids. Um, she wanted a farm. And uh, once it got rolling, I said, you know what? This will be great for my kids. I have a five-year-old and a two-year-old. Uh, let's see. When we started, Reagan was only a year old. Madison wasn't even born yet. Um, but I began to envision it as a great opportunity to raise them up in, a, in an environment that is going to help them better understand um, life, basically, you know, um, and... Uh, yeah, and, and, and spend more time with them. I can see how yeah. that, that facilitates. And I think that is going to be a little less stress for you rather than riding an ambulance or saving people's <laughs> lives, you know, uh, growing uh, trees yeah. is yeah. probably... Yeah. I think it's going to be a great vehicle to teach them about mm -hmm. small business, hard work, get up at sun up, sometimes stop work at sundown, um, you know, so, growing things, you're not always in control. So they're going mm -hmm. to learn, they're going to learn some things about, uh, about that as well. So Glenn, um, 
Where did you get the knowledge to to for the tree farms? Like, how 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 was that research? Did you have somebody that mentored you? Uh, were you um, were you just like googling and say, hey, you know what? I got the space. We got the wheel. Um, let's give it a shot. I'm gonna Google how to raise a tree farm. How did that happen? How, so, where's that aha uh, moment? <laughs> so, uh, the first three years, uh, I completely winged it. Mm -hmm. Um, I just completely and totally just planted the trees, did what research I could and just kind of walked by faith. Um, my wife and I have a motto, uh, there's a, there's an old flag from the revolutionary war time. It's a, it's got a tree on it and it says appeal to heaven. And, uh, that's kind of been our motto is to just do the work and leave the rest of it to, uh, to God. And, uh, if, uh, if it works out, then his glory it be so um so i love that doing. i've never heard it heard that saying um with the flag that's really cool so i'll give you a quick background on that um it was it was basically our first naval flag uh george washington can commission six flags um over or six ships and they flew that flag over the uh the ships um and He knew that he needed a higher power on his side because, as we all know, the British had the most powerful naval force in the history of the world. And how is his little six ships gonna gonna take that on? So, you know, they used the uh, the appeal to heaven approach, and I kind of kind of borrowed that from from him. Uh, but um, but that's what we did. And then I found out in our beginning of our fourth year, which is pretty recent. Um, that there is a South Carolina Christmas tree association. Hmm. So I contacted them, joined the association. I've made a bunch of friends and I've, and I've learned a lot. I've learned that, um, thankfully I did more things right than I did wrong. Um, what are, yeah. where are they, where are the grown things that you can do when you're, when you're planting trees and growing trees? What would be like the, the biggest mistake? The biggest mistake, um, I did something that was just a complete waste of time, mm -hmm. uh, and it's going to sound really silly, but I wasted a bunch of time doing it. Uh, I tried to bury my drip line because I didn't want to roll it up uh, every time I cross cut my grass, mm -hmm. and it just it just did not work. And I went through probably about ten thousand feet of that, oh, gosh. Um, and and I thought that I could make it work. Um, to get into all my thoughts, it would take me about 15 minutes to explain to you, but it just, it just didn't work. Mm -hmm. And then what I found, and then what I found out is the trees I'm growing are drought resistant. <laughs> so <laughs> so, so they, you don't really need a drip line. So they, so they need water. Mm -hmm. now they, they definitely need water, but they, but they really only need it that first two years. Yeah. And, and after that, you need to kind of let them go on their own. And even in that first two years, you, you don't want to overwater. So. So I put in a big irrigation system, uh -huh. um, which I need, and I'm glad I have it. Uh, but I, I probably should have not tried to, to do something interesting with the drip line. I should have just let it ride on top of the ground. Um, Glenn, what is, but, what, is, what is the most difficult part? I mean, because let me tell you, as an outsider, it looks super simple. It's like you just plant a seed, you just water, you know, first couple of years and then you forget and then come bring in people and cash in. But I know there is a lot behind the scenes. Can you yeah. tell us what is the most difficult, what is the most challenging part of being a Christmas tree farmer? Well, for me, um, planting the tree, shaping the trees, fertilizing the trees, caring for the trees, it's work, but it's something I enjoy. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, it's, It is a labor of love, and, and it's just not a hassle. Um, now, for a lot of people, that would not be the case. So for me, the hardest part is the business side of it. I do not enjoy it at all. <laughs> I have, I, you know, you have to get the right insurance, and you have to get your LLC set up, and you, you have to keep your books, and you have to, because you'll never make any money as a farmer if you don't track your, your um, expenses very closely and um and do things um very diligently so i spend a lot of time just tracking the money we spend and the and the things that we do and and making sure that 
we are set up as a as a solid business model and uh, for me that has been um a nightmare yeah, and I bet, and I bet I, that I you know it's it. it's a long term commitment. I mean, you 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 have an investment, you have you made a large investment, and you still don't see the results in three years. I mean, I um I cashed in my retirement, mm -hmm. every single penny to do this, and my wife cashed in about a third of hers. So we have um we're all in. Uh, we're gonna sink or swim, um, but we'll know uh, that we gave it everything we had um so it is a huge commitment yeah um, but everybody loves a christmas tree so i just everybody I loves a christmas for, tree well yeah. i i think it's a great thing for the community um i was talking to some friends the other day and they were talking about getting their christmas trees and not knowing where they were going this year to get them so if you could recap where where you're located, when you open, and what your hours will be so that our listeners can come help support a, a local tree farm. Yeah, so uh, we'll, uh, we will open the day after Thanksgiving um, from 9 a.m. to 8 p.m. We'll have a Santa Claus here from 1 to 4 for free photos. You'll just take your own photo if you want to bring your child by and get a photo. Um, so that'll be our grand opening. And when you say uh, after Thanksgiving, you're meaning Black Friday, correct? Yes. Okay. Yes. Friday, okay. Friday after Thanksgiving, November 24th mm -hmm. at, to 8 p.m. Um, after that, we'll be open Monday through Saturday from 9 to 5.30. And on Sundays, uh, 1 to 5.30. Um, the other thing I would tell your listeners is if they go on the South Carolina Christmas Tree Association website, um, there are farms all across South Carolina that they can go to. Maybe they live here but want to take a road trip because some people enjoy that. Mm -hmm. um, they can do that. They can find a farm at that website to do that. And then if your listeners don't live around here, they can find one close to them. Uh, one other thing we're doing on our grand opening weekend, uh, we are donating all the profit from our wreath sales. We'll have uh, Fraser Fur wreaths. Everything we make on the Fraser Fur wreaths, uh, profit-wise, will go to wreaths across America, and um, we'll be laying veteran wreaths at uh, cemeteries across the United States um, December 16th. Um, our locations are uh, United Methodist Church uh, off of Shady Grove Road. There's 60 sites there. And I um, also chose uh, Fort Jackson and National um, Arlington National Cemetery. So if anybody was to go on their website and join the Lakewood Tree Farm group, they can donate to any one of those three. And then again, if you come to us on our grand opening weekend, 100% of the profit from the wreath sales will go to Wreaths Across America. That's that, awesome. That's, that's awesome. amazing. And, and, and that actually brings up another question. Besides trees and reeds, what else do you what else do you are going to sell over there? Yeah, so we're going to have uh, this year, um, we'll have some some ornaments uh, that we had made uh, a nice little variety of those. We'll have um, we'll have uh, Christmas cookies from Bailey's, uh, which is my sister's bakery. We'll have uh, free hot chocolate for people. I have a letter writing station. If you want to bring a kid to write a letter to Santa, um, it's it's really cool little setup. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I have a friend um, with Rural Woodworks who's bringing out his wood art. Uh, so you'll be able to see that. And that's kind of what we're going to stick to this year. Kind of keep it simple. Um, but it'll be a it'll be a, a farm atmosphere. And um, Looking forward to hopefully seeing some people come out and just enjoy their time. That sounds like a fun activity to do, you know. Just go ahead, pick up a tree, pick up other things, eat some cookies, and actually help community and, you know, uh, for a good cause as well. Yep, absolutely. Yes. Well, we wish you the best of luck, and um, yes, I think you're going to do great. And we'll definitely see you uh, pretty soon because it's about time to get our Christmas tree up yes, in the house. Yes, it is. And there's yeah. nothing like the smell of a fresh cut tree. Yeah, the Fraser fir does have a really nice smell. Mm -hmm. um, so if you, if you want a tree that smells, the Fraser is the way to go. Awesome, awesome. Thank, Thank you, Glenn, Glenn, so much. Appreciate it, and good luck this year, man. Thank you all. I enjoyed getting to talk to you. All right. Take care.
That was cool. That was cool. I am really excited for them. It it reminds me of a Hallmark movie. You know, he's talking about having the Christmas trees set up and Santa and cookies and hot cocoa and just gives me all the <laughs> all the Christmassy vibes. Yeah, I'm not too big into Christmas. You know, like I I understand the religious side of of it and I appreciate that. But, you know, it's just I I'm going to tell you a secret. Why I'm not a big fan of Christmas, especially as I grow up. I don't want to sound like the Grinch. Okay, and then but I'll tell you why I'm such a big fan of Christmas. Uh, to me, it just sounds like it's cold. It's just getting cold, Allison. I'm a warm weather guy. And Christmas is snow and freezing and getting out there. And I just can't wait to get it over so we can come into <laughs> spring season, you know? I get it. I get it because I'm not I'm not a cold weather person either. So after December 31st, I'm ready for warm weather. Yeah, you still got two mm-hmm. more months yeah, of it. You usually know, that's, three. That's yeah. usually three days. Right? If you can't March, March is a crazy month. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. That's right. Um, are you gonna go buy a tree? Yes. Do, do you ever use those plastic trees ever? <laughs> Artificial, mm-hmm. um, and yes. I, so I grew up with uh, real trees. Okay. That's all we ever had, and that's all I had for years. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, honestly, one year I was trying to find a real tree around Chapin, and they all looked so sad that I went and bought an artificial one. Oh, you bought an artificial I one know, in Chapin. I'm super excited about Glenn having the really good Fraser firs because that's what I grew up with. And um, it would be very, I don't know, nostalgic almost mm-hmm. to have one back in my house. Yeah. Well, I grew up with uh, plastic trees. Obviously, there's, there's not too many pines in Venezuela, to be honest with you. They're not, you know. And it, I don't think that many people will have, uh, uh, you'll have to import them. And they were extremely expensive. Oh, too. yeah, it, sure. it was, it was, Well, you also had to import, import the uh, plastic ones. But the natural one, because it was a different, you cannot ship, you know, in a box like the, the, right. the plastic one. They were very more expensive. So... It was kind of a status thing in there. Oh, you had a natural tree? And it was like, oh, my God, they got a natural tree. They must be swimming in money, you know? All like right, so you need to take Damien and let him pick out a real tree this year. Oh, yeah, yeah. Since we moved down here, we, we always do. We okay. always do. Um, actually, Charlie has a, Charlie Wessinger, he has a, she has a farm in there. That's where we usually buy it. Uh, I'm not going to get into a fight and uh, losing clients or anything, but this year I think I'm going to give Glenn a try. He well, sounds like, uh, you know. He has a really good family thing going there. I love yeah. that he's doing it to, you know, teach his children mm-hmm. about small businesses, yeah. you know, working. Yeah. Um, it's also like renewable, yeah. which is really cool. Um, but I also love the idea that this weekend, well, it'll be next weekend, Black Friday weekend, um, that all of the proceeds from the wreaths are mm-hmm. going to the wreaths across America yeah. um, for the veterans. So that's really neat. Uh, just goes to show that they're a great family giving back to the yeah. community. Um, and I think it's going to be a fun event. Chapin is actually having their small business Saturday, okay. the Saturday after Thanksgiving. So there will be a lot of small businesses that are open, running specials. So I think it's important for us living where we do to support our local small businesses because they're families just like us um, trying to earn a living and, and give back to the community that we're in. And like I said, you know, there is something special about the smell of a pint. I love that smell, the pine inside the house. I really do. I'm going to buy you a Fraser for a candle. <laughs> <laughs> hey, um, have you ever seen the Rockefeller tree, the Christmas tree, in person? No, it's on my bucket list. Since we went to New York a few yeah. months ago, now I'm like, I've got to go at Christmas. Uh, it's, it's impressive. I was watching a video... Uh, I want to say it was yesterday or the, before yesterday. They're, they're, they're putting it up, and uh, pr- pretty much already, it's already up mm-hmm. by now. And the logistics that it takes um, putting that tree or bringing that tree, cutting that, yeah, that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. Hopefully, you know they can, they can. 
I don't know if they can grow one that big in here. Well, he said like just under a year a foot. So maybe once his kids are grown and have on the farm, that they'll have one tree, big enough for the yeah, Rockefeller the, tree. The Rockefeller tree, you know how high that can go? What's the average height? Is it 70 feet? Around that, right? So that's a 70-year tree, 75, they give or take. It's a lot. Yeah. It's a long time. It is cool. Anyway, uh, we're running out of time, Allison. As usual. But Are you going to say goodbye? You're like Goodbye. <laughs> no. Y'all, please take a minute to check out the Instagram for Lakewood Tree Farm and see what they have going on. And if you're in the market for a Christmas tree, check them out next Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Goodbye. <laughs>